The rock lives and fossils remind us of the consequences of sin. Can we trust what we see in the textbooks and in the museums? What is fact and what is fiction? What I want to talk about this afternoon is fossils and rock layers, the flood, not evolution, and millions of years. Now, we get presented in the museums and in textbooks this diagram that you can see on the screen. And many people are confused. Does that represent reality? Do we find rock layers stacked up like that? Do we find the fossils in that particular order? What about the labels on those rock layers? Are they for real? Can we trust what we see in the textbooks and in the museums? What is fact and what is fiction? And so I want to answer to begin with these questions. Is the rock and fossil sequence real or is it simply contrived to make it support evolution and millions of years? Does it show evolution in the development of life through this so-called geologic column? And does it date the rocks as millions of years old according to the geologic time scale? You see these diagrams in museums and textbooks that life has supposedly developed from the first chemicals that produced the first cell that diverged through time over millions of years, branching into all different organisms that we see today. I'm going to shock you by first of all telling you that the rock layers are real. If you don't believe me, when you leave the museum, pull over on the 275 out here in a road cut and bang your head on the rocks. They're real. Now, the other interesting thing is the local rock sequences generally follow the order that's depicted in the geologic column. And so the layers here in Cincinnati, you can compare with layers in other parts of the world, in exactly the same section of the geologic column, it seems to fit. And the other interesting thing is the fossils contained in the rock sequences generally follow the order of the fossil record. The caveat is, in those diagrams, they don't show you all the fossils that are found in the rock layers. They choose the ones that tell the supposed story of evolutionary development. So the layers are real and the sequence is real. What about the fossils we find in this sequence? Well, we have trilobites uh, and, and clams and, and sponges and echinoderms and gastropods or snails. And as we go up through the sequence of the Grand Canyon rock layers, we've only got marine fossils. Now, as we go northwards up the Grand Staircase, what do we find? We start to get not only clams, but we start to get terrestrial animals. They're bones. And we're getting a mixture of fresh and water and, and marine creatures, which you'd expect as the flood came up onto the land, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But we increasingly get land fossils as the waters cover the land. If you look at that diagram, the middle column there, you'll see drawings at the bottom of marine life. And it's only higher up you get the animal life. And so it does fit the general order. What we find in the Grand Canyon, Grand Staircase areas does fit. So how should we respond to this information? We need to start by reminding ourselves what God's Word tells us about the history of the earth. The Bible is God's history book of the universe. In fact, the reality is it's his story. What do I mean by that? It's all about Jesus Christ. It starts with Jesus as the creator, and in the middle you've got Jesus as the redeemer, and at the end you've got Jesus the coming king. And so, what does the Bible record about history, earth history? Well, we start with the creation. In the beginning, God created. The earth was created. It was initially covered in water. And then on day three, we read that God made the dry land. He put soil on it and he put plants. And he was preparing it for animals to live in and uh, making it a suitable home for man. On day five, we read that God made the flying creatures and the sea creatures. And then on day six, he filled the land with the land animals and man. The secular time scale says, no, man is only a late arrival. The universe began 13.7 billion years ago. The earth formed four and a half billion years ago. See, Jesus' time scale is radically different from the secular time scale. Who do we trust? Jesus was there who never tells a lie, who died on a cross so you and I could have a an eternal relationship with our Heavenly Father and live for eternity with Him? 
or do we trust the secular scientists who weren't there? So what do we find in the fossil record? Is the fossil record a record of life? Ha! It's a record of death. You see living things crawling around in the rocks? No, you see dead things. And you see evidence of carnivory, animals eating enough animals. We see evidence of cancer, broken teeth, fractures that are healed. So there was violence. Adam and Eve couldn't have been walking on a fossil graveyard in the Garden of Eden because that would be a record of death and destruction before they arrived. But that's what the secularists say. You see, we know they are wrong because thorns are specifically mentioned in Scripture. They come after Adam and Eve's sin, so they can't be millions and millions of years old. The secularists say, no, death and disease and suffering and bloodshed brought you and I into existence. But the Bible says, no, it was man who sinned that brought death. So how do we explain the fossils? If Adam and Eve weren't walking on a fossil graveyard in the Garden of Eden because God had created a very good world to begin with, so there couldn't be dead dinosaurs under their feet. When did the dinosaurs die? Well, there was a catastrophe. See, that's the significance of the flood, because we're we're talking about a catastrophe that consumed the whole world. Genesis 6, 5 says, The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. What an indictment. The world had become so filled with violence and wickedness that God said to Noah, I'm going to destroy all land-dwelling, air-breathing flesh and with the earth. You go back to Genesis and you read it carefully. He specifically said he was going to also destroy the earth. In Genesis 7 we read, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The water prevailed above the highest pre-flood mountains. You know, the next time someone asks you, says to you there's no evidence for the flood, you want to say to them, well, wait a minute, read to them what it says in Genesis and say, if that is true, what evidence would you look for? All flesh died. Wouldn't you expect to find billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down all over the earth? And that's exactly what we find. 70% of the earth is covered in fossil-bearing sedimentary rocks laid down by water. But how do you get a fossil fish in the first place? Look at the beautiful state of preservation of that fish. Well, here's a fish about to have his breakfast, doesn't get time to swallow it before he's buried and fossilised. You get the point? You can't preserve a fossil like that where he's just about to take a chomp and he's frozen in an instant. In fact, here's another example from a museum in Germany. That's a marine reptile, six feet long, giving birth to a baby. One minute, mother is about to give birth to a baby, Split second later, she's buried in tons and tons of mud. Fossilisation had to be catastrophic, virtually instant and rapid. Here's a fossilised jellyfish. Jellyfish are soft. They melt in the sun or get ripped apart by the wind and the waves. Or these crinoids. Look at the the heads of those crinoids or coelides. They're delicate. They have been preserved. Or the wings of this wasp. How do you fossilise a wasp like that? if it's not rapidly and catastrophically buried. Or flowers. These are soft organisms that would not be preserved. I mean, you get a a flower today and leave it out, what's going to happen to it? It's going to wither, die and fall apart. No, to preserve these organisms, you need rapid catastrophic deposition on a mass scale. So, what do the fossils show? They show evidence of death, disease and destruction. They show evidence of rapid burial in a catastrophe, the flood. They also show evidence of sudden appearance, fully formed and complex, without any ancestors in the layers beneath them. Let me unpack that for you. Even a simple cell is complex. You ask any microbiologist who looks down a microscope and they will tell you that the cell you can fit on the size of a pinpoint, is incredibly complex. In fact, one biologist said the cell is as complex as a city the size of New York or London because it's got a a brain, a control centre or a nucleus, it's got transport networks, it's got factories, it's got powerhouses, it's got all the ingredients that make up a mega city. So what do we find in the fossil record? We go from life to complex life. Cells, 
fully formed, fully functioning, ready. It's the same no matter what level we look at. These flatworms, there's no hit of any ancestors in the layers below them. They appear suddenly in the fossil record, fully formed, fully complex, like this trilobite. Now, most people think, well, that's three lobes. Trilobite, three lobes. It's got three sections to its body. By the way, you see it's got a head. That's the left-hand end. See those two knobs? That's the eyes of the trilobite. They're being fossilised. Our lenses, not these things that I have to wear, but inside here, the lenses in my eyes are made up of organic tissue. Not so the trilobite eyes. The lenses are made up of lime the same mineral that's in limestone, calcite. And we can actually study the fossilised eye of the trilobite, and here it is. It's made up of multiple lenses, all, all focusing in different directions at the same time, incredibly complex, so this creature could look in all directions and have everything in focus while he's scurried across the ocean floor. We, with our ingenuity, have only made similar lens systems in the last 50 years by intelligent input and design. If that's the case today, what was it at the time of the trilobite? Do we find any ancestors of trilobites below that could indicate how such a complex eye could develop all of its own accord? Absolutely not. You know, it's like this. Millions of years of wind and water obviously carved out the president's head. You and I can all see the evidence of intelligent planning, design and input. Here was Charles Darwin in 1859. Why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. So he realised there were none, none of these missing links. What was his explanation? The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geologic record. Well, in 1859, they hadn't explored most of the world, so we can excuse Charles Darwin. But what about today, when geologists and scientists have been in every corner of the globe? Trilobites are always trilobites. They don't change into something else. They're different shapes with different ornamentation, different sizes, but they're always trilobites. Or brachiopods or lampshells. They have different ribs, but they've got the same overall body plan. They look different from one another, but there's similarities in all their features. It's just like dogs are always dogs. From Chihuahuas to Great Danes, they're all dogs. They look different, but you know that they're dogs when you see them. We also see that once a creature appears in the fossil record, it stays the same. It was Stephen Gould who coined the word stasis. It means staying the same. Let me give you some examples. <clears throat> Go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon <clears throat> and we see there in the Grand Canyon these huge mound-looking things, these dome things. The technical term is stromatolite. What are they? Well, they're mats, fossilised mats of slime that live in the tidal zone near the beach. The sand grains go over the mat and the mat grows up on the sand grains and binds the sand grains together and then the next tie brings in more sand grains that keeps up piling up and growing these domes. How do we know that? Because the same slime is doing exactly the same thing today. Or you can see this fossil fish in the fossil record called the coelacanth. It's supposed to have died out 65 million years ago. Until 1938 we found it living off the coast of Madagascar. We've even videotaped it swimming off Japan and off Indonesia. The ginkgos in the fossil record are identical to the living ones. We recognise beetles in the fossil record because they're identical to the living beetles. So, we find evidence of death, disease, destruction. We find evidence of rapid burial in a catastrophe. We find evidence of death and extinction. And we find evidence of rapid mass destruction and burial on a global scale in the flood. Yes? We don't find the fossils as individuals. We find them en masse. If you don't believe me, go off the 275 into one of those road cuts and that's exactly what the limestones, the hard layers that you'll find in all the road cuts around Cincinnati, full of corals, clams, brachiopods and crinoids, all broken up and smashed up, bryozoans. The limestones are jam-packed with all the broken remains of these creatures everywhere you look. 
When we see fossils, do we know that's where they died? No. Do we know where the, that's where they lived? No. One thing we know is that's where they buried because we observe them buried in the rocks, in that location. So how do you get a whale and possum that didn't live together to be buried together? The ocean covered the land. Many of you are familiar with the chalk cliffs of the White Cliffs of Dover, the English Channel, made up of chalk, a type of limestone. Under the microscope, you can see trillions, literally trillions of microscopic shellfish. And when we look at the fossil record, what do we find? We find marine fossils throughout the record. Yes, some became extinct, but many survived all the way through the flood. They didn't have to go on the ark, by the way, because they could live in the water and survive in the water through the flood. Lastly, what do the rock layers show? Well, they show that the ocean waters flooded over the continents. How do I know that? Because there are marine fossils in rock layers covering the continents. That's right. Marine fossils. Wouldn't you expect if they were marine that, that creatures lived in the ocean, they'd buried in the ocean? Well, why are they buried up on the continents? They had to get transported, lifted up by the floodwaters and dumped up on the continents. And wouldn't you and I expect to find widespread, rapidly deposited rock layers because the flood was a global and it went all around the earth? Yes. We find rock layers that can be traced all the way across continents and even between continents. Let me give you examples. The Tapeach sandstone at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. It's the first layer of the flood. It sits on that erosion surface that marks the beginning of the flood. There we can see it. That's the view from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. That little cliff at the bottom there sitting on top of an erosion surface. Let's look at it a little bit more closely. We can study its characteristics. You know what? We can trace that sandstone in outcrop and in drill holes all the way across North America, across to Greenland. You can go to Whis Chippewa Falls in Wisconsin and you can see exactly the same sandstone with exactly the same features sitting on exactly the same erosion surface sitting on the same crystalline basement. You can see it on a road cut in Missouri as well, in between. The same sandstone can be traced right across North Africa, right over to southern Israel, near at Timna. You've got the same sandstone with the same fossils, the same features, with the same erosion surface sitting on the same crystalline basement. And this is my last example, the chalk cliffs of England. Remember we looked under the microscope, this type of limestone is made up of trillions of microscopic shellfish. What I didn't tell you last time is that you can trace that limestone across the Northern Ireland, but you can also trace it across Europe to Germany, the Netherlands, Germany, Poland, all the way down to Israel, Egypt, Turkey, Kazakhstan. By the way, at the bottom of that cliff, a shepherd boy picked up five smooth stones to slay a giant. There's the same chalk beds as on the English Channel coast. And we've got the same chalk in the Midwest of the United States, from Alabama across to, Cal to uh, Colorado, from ne Nebraska to Texas. That's a global scale fossil graveyard made of all these trillions of microscopic shellfish. Well, what do the scientists say about the formation of this limestone called chalk? They say the chalk beds formed over millions of years as lime grain by lime grain and tiny shell by tiny shell fell to the ocean floor. They say a fraction of an inch every thousand years. Oh, by the way, that's on the ocean floor. Where do we find the chalk? Up on the continent. What other fossils are buried in the chalk beds? Well, if we go to the Nibrera chalk in uh, Kansas, we find it's full of crinoids, perfectly formed crinoids that, that had to be catastrophically buried. Or, or this fish didn't get time to digest its food. You see the size of that fish? It's 12 foot long. Would you bury that a fraction of an inch every thousand years? The fish would have digested itself and swam away, wouldn't it? Or in the same chalk bed, you've got pliosaur fossils and turtle fossils 10 and 12 feet long across. You've got dinosaur fossils and bird fossils in the same chalk beds. How would you gradual, grain by grain, a fraction of an inch every thousand years on the ocean floor over millions of years, bury together such large sea, land and air-dwelling creatures on the continents? not on the ocean floor. See my point? Only if the ocean waters rose and swept across the continents, catastrophically burying these land and sea and air-dwelling creatures altogether, 
in this global scale fossil graveyard. That's the chalk pits. Only the flood makes sense of that kind of evidence. Well, is the rock and fossil sequence real? Yes, we've learnt that today. Is it simply contrived to make it support evolution in millions of years? No, it's real. Does it show any evolutionary development of life in the geologic column? No, no, no. Do the fossils date the rocks as millions of years according to the geological time scale? No, no, no. The fossils don't come have labels on them higher on millions of years old. They're just fossils. Do we find marine creatures buried and fossilised on the continents? Yes, yes, yes. Were the creatures buried rapidly and thus the rock layers formed rapidly? Yes, yes, yes. Do some rock layers have a global extent? Yes, yes. Are the rock layers and fossils consistent with a global flood? Yes, indeed. So you see, when we start with God's word, as our authoritative eyewitness account of Earth history, the fossil record is consistent with the global cataclysmic Genesis flood. It explains the sudden appearance of fossil creatures, their design, complexity and their varieties, their death and extinction, the burial order of pre-flood biological communities or biomes and creatures during the progressive integration of the global flood, and the rock layers with the marine fossils covering the continents are emphatic evidence as being the result of the global flood. So, the rock layers and fossils remind us of the consequences of sin, our sin, and God's judgment. You know, imagine that. Man was so wicked and the earth was so full of violence that God had to go to that extent, that extent to start all over again.